And is this, so when we think about the normal function of the endocannabinoid system, you've essentially told us it's this homeostatic mechanism that regulates more or less everything from, you know, pain and anxiety to feeding behavior to, to all sorts of stuff. Is that why something like cannabis, something with THC has so many different effects and side effects that seem to go in every direction? Some people say that they consume cannabis, it makes them less anxious. Some people yeah. consume cannabis, it makes them more anxious. Is that, does it have to do with this flooding of the brain with THC and the fact that these receptors are controlling so many processes? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, the joke we always have is like cannabinoids influence everything but regulate nothing <laughs> because they, you know, they're not essential for anything to occur. They're just, they modulate everything. Um, but I, I think for sure, I mean, that's why there's so many diverse effects of cannabis on someone when they consume it. I mean, you have hemodynamic effects on blood pressure and vasodilation. You have you know, some effects on feeding, which again, like you said, can go in either direction. I mean, we classically think of the munchies as a consequence of cannabis, but you consume too much THC and it goes in the complete opposite direction. People can start vomiting uncontrollably. Mm -hmm. People lose their appetite if they kind of, you know, I don't want to say overdose, but overconsume THC or cannabis and they have too much of it. Like you said, you know, most people, most recreational cannabis users use cannabis because they say it reduces their stress and anxiety. And if you ask people who've tried cannabis who do not use it recreationally, almost always they say because it made them anxious. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that you get this. And I always say it's weird. It's not like a graded response where some people have reduced anxiety and other people it doesn't really do as much. It's like a, a polar opposite response where for some people they find it helps them calm down and other people it throws them into a panic attack. So it's very interesting that a drug can do that when it's one drug targeting one receptor. But some of this is going to be individual variation with receptor expression. And one of the things that we've learned from the animal side of things is these kind of opposite effects, like what you were mentioning with anxiety, mm -hmm. uh, this seems to be dictated by CB1 receptors on different neuron populations. Mm -hmm. So what we've, what we've learned from mouse genetics is that if we remove cannabinoid receptors off of excitatory neurons, so cannabinoids can no longer suppress uh, excitatory neurotransmission, um, we lose all the effects of THC in terms of the standard intoxication effects. So like sedation, the changes in the body temperature, pain processing, all these things, they're all lost if you take CB1 off of excitatory neurons. If you take it off inhibitory neurons, it does very little. Yeah, hmm. All the effects of THC look pretty similar. Um, however, if you start going to really high doses of THC where you get these opposite effects, then that seems to be where CB1 on the inhibitory neurons plays a role. And so in the context of anxiety, because that's the easiest one to explain, you can take this to the amygdala. So if we look at the amygdala in the basic sense of, we know the amygdala becomes too excitable um, in anxiety states and in individuals who have anxiety disorders, it's hyperactive, there's more activity than we should normally be having. Um, and we know things like benzodiazepines and most drugs that treat anxiety, reduce neural activity in the amygdala, usually by promoting inhibitory transmission. So if we look at how cannabinoids regulate anxiety, what we've learned is that in the amygdala, if THC activates CB1 on an excitatory neuron, it decreases the amount of uh, excitatory transmitter like glutamate that's going to be released. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence in the amygdala, that will calm the amygdala down. Mm -hmm. And so that seems to be why THC at you know, moderate and lower doses is reliably anxiolytic because it seems to be primarily suppressing glutamate release in the amygdala and keeping it quiet. As you start jacking doses up and you go to a higher level, uh, then it starts to saturate CB1 on GABA, and it seems to do the opposite because now what it's doing is turning off inhibition, and then you get the opposite the effect opposite where you start effect. getting more excitation. And so you get this, it's almost like you kind of cross a threshold and it flips. Yeah. And suddenly before it was quieting it down, and now it's making it more active. So that's interesting because in, so in, in the scientific world, you, you often talk about something like an inverted U-shaped effect where, where something switches at a low versus high dose. And that's what this sounds like in the cannabis world where people aren't really so familiar with some of the mechanisms that can be at play here. People talk about a multiphasic or a biphasic effect. Yeah. And it sounds like that's exactly what we're talking about. And the basis for that is at a relatively low dose, you're affecting one type of neuron in the brain, say an excitatory neuron in this case, an endocannabinoid at that dose would actually make things quieter, but then you go up higher and you start hitting those inhibitory neurons and you get the opposite thing happening. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, I mean, so if we, if you delete CB1 on glutamate and you give them low dose THC, it doesn't reduce anxiety anymore. 
So you need it there. And exactly like you're saying, if you delete it off of the inhibitory GABA neurons and you go that high dose where they normally get anxious, they no longer get anxious. So we know that those different receptor populations mediate it. But you're exactly right. It is entirely an inverted U curve. And normally where we would sit is probably somewhere on the ascending arm of the first part of the U, mm -hmm. because depending on what your basal level of endocannabinoid function is, because we know if you completely disrupt endocannabinoid function, that also enhances anxiety. But we know if you kind of go all the way around the inverted U and you end on the other side, too much also increases anxiety. But the disrupting, if you reduce endocannabinoid function, that is probably increasing anxiety because now you're affecting uh, the CB1 and glutamate. So again, you're causing more excitation because mm -hmm. you're kind of removing that break system that would normally exist on the excitatory neuron. So it is entirely a, an inverted U curve. But yeah, biphasic tends to be how people in general public will refer to it that you know, you're usually safer with low doses and you go higher doses and, you know, everyone has a different threshold, but you cross that threshold and kind of everyone will have an adverse event. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely know people who, I mean, this all makes a lot of sense because, you know, I know people who can consume a lot of THC and have mm -hmm. no side effects at yeah. anything approaching a normal dose. And then there's other people who, who, you know, even two and a half milligrams of THC can be problematic. Yeah. It's, and the thing is, I mean, there hasn't been enough work in this, but it's interesting because it makes you wonder how much of this is just dictated by individual variability in CB1 expression. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I've always been fascinated by is there's a lot of reports in the literature that women will have um, a kind of a narrow window to have an adverse event. Like women will more likely have an anxiety or a panic-like response if they consume cannabis, uh, even at lower doses than is typically seen in men. And some of the stuff we've seen in the animal work and some of the suggestions we've seen come out of the pet imaging in humans is women may indeed actually have more CB1 receptors than men, which just means that, that that window of when you go from too little to too much might be a much narrower threshold. Now, if this was the 70s, the 80s, when cannabis was like 5% THC, <laughs> you would have a lot more room to play with that window. But yeah, nowadays, yeah. when you're talking like 25% THC, this can, like, you could probably cross that threshold with like a single toke. Like, mm -hmm. one toke is not going to do too much, too much, two tokes is too much. Like, that's how mm -hmm. narrow it seems to be for some people, from what I've seen and heard um, about like how quickly they can go from it being okay to not being okay.